Greetings, Fright Knights and Monster Girls. It's your old pal, Count Dracula from the planet Dracula, where bad movies <laughs> stalk the night. <laughs> and have you noticed that 80s nostalgia seems to have come back again? And I'm not just talking about a resurrection of old 80s properties either, like Transformers, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and Mad Max. No. I mean a return to the style of the 80s. A lot of films that came out in the last two years, like The Guest, John Wick, and Turbo Kid, not to mention Guardians of the Galaxy, have hardcore brought back the colorful lighting, ridiculous action, and musical stylings that were at the heart and soul of 80s cinema. And why wouldn't you want to bring that shit back? The 80s was the best decade of entertainment ever! It had the best horror movies, the best music, punk rock and heavy metal, and movies that had tits because PG-13 hadn't even been invented yet. There was sex, drugs, Reaganomics, G.I. Joe, Max Head Head Hedro, AIDS denial. Everyone remember AIDS denial? Oh. Oh, I, I guess you wouldn't. But that wasn't even the best part. The best part was, we tried to assassinate our own president, and we got jelly beans out of it. So fuck this modern world with its smartphones and America onlines. I'm gonna use my trusty time phone, which I just happen to have, and fucking rotary dial my way back to my 80s consciousness. So fuck you suckers. We out. <laughs> Hello. Hey man. It's the 90s calling. 90s? Oh shit, man! What up? Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, 80s. I, I just had to call you. We, we made a horrible mistake. Dukakis is president? Worse. Are we still a virgin? Oh no, don't worry about that. We totally lose our virginity. <laughs> Bitchin'. Yeah, we meet this one girl, like, at a convention, and she just has the... Oh my god! Yeah! Well, so then why are you willing? Because everything else sucks now! Horror in America is a joke, punk is fucking over, and now there's a television show on TV telling kids it's cool to recycle! It is never cool to recycle. And worse yet, everyone is fucking PC! Apple Computers doesn't make it. Oh. Oh, you live in bliss. It's okay, I'm sure everything will be fine. Uh, hey, l l maybe we just need to go a little bit farther. Uh, let's uh, dial up 2001 A Space Odyssey, see what's going on there. What are we gonna do? I don't know, maybe we need to go farther. I'll call 2015. Hurry, do it. Oh my god, I'm like so offended you called. Ah! 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 Kid is right, it's a downward spiral! It's not politically correct, guys. It's just common decency. Run! The future is fucked! While the 80s had no shortage of highly memorable zombie movies like Night of the Creeps, Night of the Comet, and not to mention Night Patrol. Man, a lot of stuff happening at night in the 80s. Cause that's when the freaks come out. But undoubtedly the 80s most important and influential entry into the zombie genre was Return of the Living Dead. And that importance can be summed up in one single word. Brains. That's right. 
It's the movie that established that zombies eat brains. For 1985, no zombies ate brains. But now it's practically synonymous with walking corpses. Ask anyone what zombies eat now, and they'll say brains. And that is part of the enduring legacy of writer-director Dan O'Bannon. You might remember Dan O'Bannon from a little movie he made. Small film, really. You know, it was called uh, Dark Star. Oh, wait. I mean, fucking alien. Not to mention Total Recall, Life Force. Oh, yeah, and uh, what about this? Okay, 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 you see that? Somebody wrote that. Somebody actually wrote, Man in 60s Corvette drops to Earth from space shuttle to Riggs's radar rider. Little as fuck. And that man was Dan O'Bannon. All right, enough of this shit. It's time to put your mohawks up and pull your panties down as we prepare to get a face full of return of the living dead. You realize that's a stinger to the wrong movie, right? Our story begins at You Need a Medical Supply as Bert, the owner, takes off for the weekend, leaving his most trusted manager, Frank, to train the new guy, Freddy. It's the kind of place hospitals and medical schools buy skeletons, cadavers for surgical practice, and... These are split dogs. Wow. Oh, we get a lot of orders for split dogs. Because all weekends, we're Kentucky's shittiest hot dog on a stick. See, there's the ketchup. Meanwhile, this group of fine, upstanding young citizens are Scuzz, Tina, Casey, Spider, and Trash, played by the legendary Linnea Quigley. I like death. Well, hello, baby. I like death with sex. Shut up, you little preppy fuck. You are ruining this for me. Oh, you guys, that'd be really rad. But I'm supposed to meet Freddy when he gets off work. Yeah, where are you supposed to meet him? In your dreams, bitch! Ah ha ha! Shit! Why did you say so? Why do we all go pick Freddy up? Freddy always knows where there's a place to party. Well, that's right, bitch. I always know where to party. But I'm laying down tracks on my new album at the moment. Freddy's Greatest Hits! Available soon on record tape or 8-track for $19.95. Back at You Need a Medical Supply, an important question is about to be asked. Frank? Yeah, kid. What's the weirdest thing you've ever saw in here? Let me ask you a question, kid. Did you see that movie, Night of the Living Dead? Yes. Everybody should. Frank here explains that the movie Night of the Living Dead was based on real events, and the evidence is right downstairs. By the way, I just want to point something out that was really awesome about the 80s. Back then, if your movie didn't have enough titty, you just put it in the background. Well, let's not titty tally any longer. Back to the movie. That's not possible. I mean, they showed zombies taking over the world. Uh, dude, I think you're talking about Dawn of the Dead. That's the one where the zombies take over the world. In Night of the Living Dead, they menace a farmhouse and cops shoot a black guy. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. By the way, Return of the Living Dead actually has no relation to Night of the Living Dead except for the title. It turns out that George Romero and John Russo, who's the producer of Return of the Living Dead, got into a legal battle because they used to be partners. They actually made Night of the Living Dead together. Uh, but they got into this weird argument over who had the right to use the phrase Living Dead when they split. And the courts decided that George Romero didn't have the right to use the phrase living dead, but John Russo did. And that's why this series is called Return of the Living Dead, but all the George Romero flicks from the 80s on out are simply blank of the dead. Hello? Hey, this is George Romero. I just wanted to call and say, fuck you. So having told Freddy about the mysterious evidence in the basement, Frank decides to show him. Oh shit, look at that. <laughs> hey, these things don't leak, do they? Leak, hell no, these things were made by the US Army Corps of Engineers. <laughs> oh, <fuck! laughs> 
Uh, I don't care what you just said, dude. That canister clearly leaks the title sequence. And here's the horror remake pipeline fucking up everything you know and love. And speaking of fucking up everything you know and love, America! Fucking shit up since forever. All right, so we're at some military guy's house now, and, uh... Huh. Look, this is clearly neither zombies nor titties. So my interest just plummeted. Zero stars. Actually, this scene was cut from the theatrical release, but was put back in for the home video release. And I kind of see why they took it out for the theatrical, because there's really nothing here that we don't get from the rest of the movie. But I like it because it has this one great dialogue exchange. What's for dinner? Your favorite, lamb chops. I had them for lunch. <laughs> And speaking of thug life, let's get back to our punks. Where the fuck are we going anyway? To party! To pick up Freddy! Oh yeah, what the fuck is Freddy up to these days anyway? I'm working on my new rap album with the Fat Boys. Oh yeah, Fat Boys. They're gonna be around forever. Not like that hack Will Smith with his nightmare on my street. Not even my voice on the album. <laughs> Looking for Freddy, the punks pull up to You Need Medical Supply. Man, what a hideous, ugly place. Now, Fright Nights and Monster Girls, once again, it is time for me to prepare you. Drink in my favorite line in the movie. I like it. It's a statement. I like it. It's a statement. I just love that. I like it. It's a statement. What time does Freddy get off? 10 o'clock. I ain't sitting here two fucking hours. We could go fool around in there for a while. You mean that cemetery? Oh, oh, oh let's uh. do that. Girl, that is a mixed signal. Your mouth is saying, I don't give a rat's ass, but your eyes are clearly saying panty drippings. <sighs> Meanwhile, Frank and Freddy wake up and on cue shit is coming alive. Like I said earlier, worst hot dog on a stick ever. The worst. Get in there! Oh, Jesus Christ! That goddamn chemicals! It's all over everything! Stupid asshole! Hang on a minute. Bert is a slave driver and a cheap son of a bitch who's going bald too. Ha ha. Oh man, the PMRC is right. Subliminal messages are in everything. Meanwhile, back at the graveyard, things are getting existential as Trash asks one of the most important questions of our time. Do you ever fantasize about being killed? Woohoo! Down boy. The best is yet to come. For me, the worst way would be for a bunch of old men to get around me and start fighting and eating me alive. First, they would tear off my clothes. Ooh, whoa, 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 whoa. We still need one more thing. Wait a minute. They took away way the for JJ. You did what? You see, even the movie is shocked and appalled. You open it. No movie. <laughs> It'll never open again. <laughs> I got this! <laughs> yeah, the original scene here was for Trash to be completely naked, pubic hair on display. But when co-producer Graham Henderson saw what they were filming, he freaked out and demanded they remove her pubic hair. A quick shave later, they started filming again, and he said, That's even worse! You can see everything! So they covered her entire crotch with a prosthetic they made by pouring alginate 
into Linnea Quigley's panties while she was wearing them. Back at the warehouse, Bert comes back after having been called by Frank, and there's a hilarious scene where they try to figure out how to handle one particularly animated corpse. They come to the very logical solution of trying to destroy the brain, but that doesn't work. I thought you said if we destroyed the brain, it'd die. It worked in the movie! I mean the movie line! They then try dismemberment, but that doesn't work either. So they figure maybe burning it in the crematory across the street will work. Meanwhile, Suicide makes a declaration that all 80s punks can identify with. What do you think this is all about? You think this is a fucking costume? This is a way of life. Yeah, punk rock for life! Except for that time when I was a goth in the 90s. And then a raver in the, the late 90s. And Fuck you, I don't gotta justify shit. I went wherever the drugs and pussy were best. Hey, is that Freddy? Where? Over there going into that building. Nope, that is not Freddy. Why would Freddy be going into a mortuary? Oh, I don't know, maybe because you're within walking distance of the medical supply place he works at. You know, you really are a dumb yuppie motherfucker. I'm sending you to the cornfield. Hmm, wonder what other 80s references I can make right about now. Holy shit! Orange headphones, motherfucker! Hey! Listen to me, you big blue bastard! Take those headphones off that tape, and that player is mine! Orange foam Radio Shack headphones. So 80s, they're worth murdering over. So no, this isn't Star-Lord's real father, it's Ernie the Mortician. Bert tries to get Ernie- Yeah, no shit, there are two characters in this movie called Bert and Ernie. Dan O'Bannon swears this was a coincidence, but, uh, I, I don't know, man. I don't think I buy it. Bert tries to get Ernie to let... God, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> Bert tries to get Ernie to let them use the crematorium by telling him they've got a bunch of... Rabid weasels. What? What the hell are you doing with a bunch of rabid weasels? You know how these things happen. No, I don't. How do they happen? That's another great thing about Return of the Living Dead. People are not complete idiots unless the character is supposed to be a complete idiot. Like when Bert comes in and is like, hey Ernie, you know how these things happen. Like Ernie's response is incredibly reasonable. I don't, I don't. how do they happen? After showing Ernie the dismembered corpse, he agrees to burn it up in the incinerator. Unfortunately, this just spreads the chemical into the air, which then comes down as rain, reanimating the entire graveyard, which is where the kids are partying. Now, as you watch Linnea Quigley run around this graveyard without clothing, you're probably asking yourself, is she going to be naked throughout the whole rest of the movie? The whole thing, motherfucker! Lord Satan! Oh, Lord Satan! Give us this day our daily spread and deliver us from the MPAA, which prevented us from seeing Linnea Quigley's a pink pussy hair. Oh man, we gotta go back to these guys? Now nah, fuck that, let's look at Linnea Titley some more. Oh, yes! <laughs> okay, so these guys... Psych! We ain't done! Look at that! Behold the butt jiggle! Oh, I just want to slap that! Back in the crematorium, Freddy and Frank are getting visibly sick from the chemical spill. And to his credit, Bert isn't the kind of asshole to just brush it off with, Ah, walk it off, big guy! You just need some orange juice! He's like, oh shit, why didn't you say something? We need to get you to a doctor! Meanwhile, Tina, who separated from the group earlier, in a scene I didn't show you, walks into You Need a Medical Supply. And here it is, guys. The fateful moment. The first time this line is ever uttered by a zombie. Brains. Okay, yeah, like, technically that yellow cadaver says it first, but try to make that out. <laughs> compared to this. Brains. Tina gets trapped in a closet by the tar man zombie just as the rest of the punks come in. Oh yeah, by the way, we call him the tar man. Not important to the plot, just, you know, so you can say you're cool. Hey, you take that towel off right now. I don't care if you're cold. You shiver for the camera. They hear Tina's screams and run to the basement just in time for us to witness tar man figure out how to open the locked door. It's at this point we realize that the zombies aren't just mindless corpses, 
They're actually intelligent. Don't worry, everyone. He can still make a living in the future as a media culture critic, whatever that is. He's white, male, and has no brains. I think his name is Jonathan McIntosh now. And speaking of amazing deductive reasoning, watch this bit of detective work. Why your stethoscope? What's better? I can't hear anything through mine. Well, then maybe you should put that stethoscope in your ears. I mean, you know, just saying. Get a grip on your shit, kid! You've got a mohawk! Show some pride! At about this time, they realize it was Freddy going into the mortuary, and they run over there. Good thing, too, because we get to see more of Linnea Quigley's Jiggly. But they forgot an important safety tip, which is that zombies are attracted to the sounds of dad ass. Well, apparently that skeleton wants to party. Hey, wait a minute. Do you want a party? It's like there's a party in my mouth. And everyone's got herpes. Oh, by the way, nephew. Plenty of squigglies getting her ass eaten. What where? Oh. The other... Ass... Yeah, I... I, I don't know why I thought the other one. Oh man, I always feel bad for Trash here. Of all the deaths in the movie, this one is the cruelest. She admitted earlier that this was her worst fear. When it was just a fantasy, it kind of turned her on. Like a lot. But that arousal was coming from a place of terror. And when it's real, it is not sexy at all. It's kind of like how a person with a rape fantasy doesn't actually want to be raped. They just kind of want to pretend because they got a kink. You know, not for real real, just for play play. Meanwhile, on Return of the Living Dead SVU, the paramedics make an important discovery. You have no pulse. Your blood pressure is zero over zero. You have no pupillary response, no reflexes. Your temperature is 70 degrees. Are you saying we're dead? No, we're saying you're Lyndon Johnson. What the fuck do you think? Whoa, knock at the door. Better pull out the gun. Freezing, you're dead! Are you crazy? Are you on PCP? Why PCP specifically? More important question, why were safety pins such a big fashion accessory in the 80s? Ah, just one of those inexplicable trends, I guess. Don't judge! In a few years, you guys are all gonna be fucking trying to explain why you got ponies on everything. All I'm saying is that in the annals of trendy fashion, there's the regrettable, and then there's fucking virginity insurance. But there's no excuse for that faux hawk. You gotta commit to the hawk. Commit to the hawk, bitch! Meanwhile, the paramedics leave not knowing the danger that's outside. But no time for that now. We gotta close this ambulance door in time to exploit the handicapped. A handicapped actor almost touched me. Gotta call the police. Oh, hey, Uncle Varney. Oh, hey there. By the way, invited some friends over. Why don't you ask them if they're all on PCP? The answer is yes. Great, zombie Hitler. What's next? Copy over. Come in this fashion. Stand for paramedics. Uh, yeah, this is dispatch. Could you repeat that? Does it sound legit to you? You better do what he says. It sounds like zombie Hitler. Meanwhile, they finish boarding up the mortuary and check on the others. You know, it looks like uh, rigor mortis is setting in. Ah, the mortis? Ah, what, do you, what do you mean? Rigor mortis. Oh, God. <laughs> You're dead. You're dead, man, and you're gonna turn into one of those things out there! Keep your grip on your shit, Scuzz! Do not make the hawk look bad! Oh, hey, those paramedics arrived. Man, these zombie lurches are everywhere. They run to reinforce the barricade, but one of the zombies gets in, killing Scuzz. But you'll be happy to know that his mohawk went on to have a rich, full life. I heard he's married and has two kids now.
Ernie, hoping to understand what is going on, captures the zombie that killed Scuzz and straps it to a table. He asks it, why do they eat brains? And gets a chilling answer. The pain. What about the pain? The pain of being dead. I can feel myself rot. Eating brains. How does that make you feel? It makes the pain go away. It hurts to be dead. Hey, look, man. Fuck this. Yeah, something. not Michael Jackson is no. getting out of this thriller. Oh, by the way, zombie titty! Mm. Ooh, and speaking of which, looks like we aren't done with Linnea Quigley yet. Man, undead chicks are so much harder than- ah! Well, could be worse. Could be Linnea Quigley now. Meanwhile, oh, tell why front. I would totally do some hot cougar Linnea Quigley act. <laughs> what just happened? At this point, Bert, Ernie, and Spider know it's just a matter of time before Freddy and Frank turn. And they suggest locking them in the chapel. You bastard! Why don't you lock yourselves up? We just want to lock them in another room so we can figure out how to get the hell out of here, all right? Tina, that really is a good idea. Why are you treating this like you need her permission? All I'm saying is I think we'd understand if you went Ike on that Tina right about now. Not being able to abandon Freddy, okay. Tina insists that they lock her in the chapel with them. This cannot possibly go wrong. Spoilers, it goes wrong. One thing, and one thing only that can leave this world suffering. What, Freddy? What? Live brain! <laughs> As things quickly go from bad to worse, Ernie breaks his leg and Bert and Spider decide to make a break for one of the cars. Bert, that favor that you owe me, watch your ass out there. I just love little character moments like that. What the fuck are we gonna do now? Oh shit, we're driving into Thriller. Quick, change it to Smooth Criminal. They crash into the medical supply store and are reunited with Casey and Chuck. Fucking car is total, man. That's all right. My car is still out there, and so is Frank's. Well, Michael Jackson's on fire again. Back in the mortuary, Tina and Ernie try to get away from Freddy by heading into the attic, and Frank makes a noble sacrifice. This scene, arguably the most emotional moment of the film, was suggested on set by James Karen, the actor that played Frank. Everything from the self-immolation to taking off his wedding ring was his idea. When he first suggested it, Dan O'Bannon asked Karen, okay, um, but how does Frank even know how to work the crematorium? And then James Karen, in a moment of brilliance, came up with this line on the spot. Some big favor. I can operate that goddamn thing. You gotta have a good script. But sometimes the best stuff ain't even on the page. With the zombies killing everyone that tries to help them, Bert does the only thing he can think to do and calls the number on the canister, hoping the army has a plan. They do. Hey, listen. And as the ashes of the town rise into the sky, the whole thing starts over again. Literally, this is the same footage from before. And that's the movie. It's nihilistic as fuck, but undeniably energetic and entertaining. And that's why it's the quintessential 80s zombie movie. I don't take anything back. The 80s were a complete blast. But it was kind of that way because you had an entire generation of kids growing up pretty much believing we were not gonna live to see 30. How could we? Nuclear war didn't just seem like a possibility, it was an almost certainty. 
And if the nuclear blast didn't get us, toxic waste or acid rain would. It just seemed like society was going to collapse somehow. And when you grow up with that, what are you going to do? Well, you're going to make love and party till you die. It's a strangely pessimistic yet life-affirming attitude that I think we would do well to remember in the modern age. It's clear through watching the movie that Dan O'Bannon's sympathies firmly resided with the punks, as he was never one to blame outsiders for the evils of society. I mean, I was tired of seeing punks portrayed in movies and television as villains. I knew punks. They were the nicest people in the world. He recognized that if the kids around him were angry, self-destructive, and doing drugs, they only did so because they felt like the living dead, just looking for something to ease the pain of living, just as his zombies craved brains to ease the pain of being dead. A clear metaphor for drug addiction it could not be. Which is not to say that Dan O'Bannon was anti-drug. Far fucking from it. That guy is famous for getting high with some of the most influential artists of his day. For instance, he got so high with Alejandro Jodorowsky that it literally changed the face of cinematic storytelling. This is special marijuana. I said, oh boy. Seriously, if those two men had not gotten high together, most of the movies you know and love would not exist. But that is a tale for another time. Speaking of another time, I think I'd rather remember the best parts of the 80s than relive them with the worst. So long, 80s. Maybe I'll come back someday. <laughs> It's just not the same. <sighs> Hello? Hi, is this Count Jackula? Yeah, who's calling? It's Scuzz's Mohawk, man! Oh shit, what up, brother? Oh, you know, getting ready for Halloween, taking the kids trick-or-treating with the wife, I uh, heard you got married. Yeah, can't be a free hawk forever, dude. Oh man, who is the lucky lady? Linnea Quigley's vagina. Hey, Jackie! Ooh, still got to think redheads, huh? You know it, brother. Well, man, just wanted to call up and check to see if you'd be at the Ramones reunion tour. Wait, aren't almost all of them dead? Yeah. Remember, kids, the 80s aren't dead. They just smell. Share with